Um, hello, everyone. Uh, we are very happy to have Professor Michael Cates as our Thursday RRI colloquium speaker today. Uh, Professor Cates is the 19th Lucasian Professor of Mathematics and a Royal Society Research Professor in the Department of Applied Mathematics and Theoretical Physics at the University of Cambridge. He's an elected fellow of the Royal Society and an international member of the US National Academy of Sciences. Professor Cates has made extremely important contributions to the area of non-equilibrium statistical mechanics of driven soft systems. He's worked on polymers, colloids, surfactants, granular matter systems. He's the recipient of several extremely prestigious awards, including the gold medal, the Bingham medal, and the Weisenberg Award. For the past decade and a little more, Professor Cates has been working on active materials. Uh, most of you are aware of his uh, very important work in the area of motility induced phase separation. Today, he will tell us about entropy production in, so in active matter. Professor Cates, thanks so much for agreeing to be our colloquium speaker today. Uh, the floor is now all yours. Thank you very much. And it's a great pleasure to be here, even if only virtually. Um, OK, so I'm going to talk today about entropy production in active matter. And I shall be trying to make a distinction in the second part of the talk between informatic and thermodynamic entropy production. And of course, I will explain what I mean by those things. Um, so uh, the, that part of the talk uh, is based on this uh, PRX paper by uh, Toma Markovic, uh, Etienne Fodor, Elson Chung, and myself. It builds on earlier work we did on um, uh, calculating entropy production for active field theories, which was this Nardini et al. paper. So let me try and take control of the... Okay, so I will uh, briefly outline uh, the kind of fundamentals of active particle systems and uh, then introduce the kinds of scalar continuum theories, so uh, stochastic field theories that we've been developing for active matter um, over recent years. And I want to focus today on issues to do with stochastic thermodynamics. So I'll introduce what I need in terms of that topic, first for particles, just in, in a, a Langevin particle to illustrate the basic points, and then for fields. So. Um, I should be talking today about two different types of entropy production, although mathematically they may have the same uh, you know, equations. Um, and these apply under different conditions in active matter systems. Some active matter systems are so far from equilibrium that the idea of a free energy is just a fanciful concept. And an example I will be using is phase separation of large animals, so a mixed flock of sheep and goats that phase separated in, into sheep and goats. Um, but it turns out that the concept of entropy production is still very valuable there. It's a, a, a very useful quantifier of whether a, a system like that is behaving in a macroscopically irreversible way when you coarse grain it and just think about densities of things rather than you know, the metabolism of a sheep. But there are other active systems, for instance, inside uh, individual cells where there are uh, uh, objects formed by phase separation, they're called membraneless organelles, where the concept of a free energy is not fanciful at all. One is close enough to equilibrium to talk about heat flow and thermodynamics, and then uh, we can think about a real entropy production, an actual uh, heat production for the dynamics of the system. So that's the thermodynamic variety. And what I'll be focusing on in that last part is that the thermodynamic entropy production, to capture that, you need to consider the specific microscopic processes that are causing uh, irreversible terms to occur, occur in the continuum theories. And then I'll conclude. So let me just start with a recap of the kind of systems we're talking about. Um, so they could be colloids, microorganisms, but also at a smaller scale than uh, colloids, subcellular systems. So here's a, some kind of myosin motor, or well, a motor anyway, moving along a microtubule. Uh, bacteria, self-propelled. Uh, uh, single-celled uh, um, life forms. Uh, there are synthetic counterparts uh, on, again, on the colloidal scale uh, of the same sort of length scale as bacteria based on uh, colloidal particles that have asymmetric uh, surfaces and asymmetrically catalyze some fuel supply in the solvent, which is typically hydrogen peroxide. Uh, that creates local gradients in fuel and products, uh, and then the um, because the colloids are asymmetric, they then move along these gradients. And then at a larger scale, things like flocks of animals, fish, etc. So um, 
it's interesting to consider, you know, to what extent these all have similar descriptions at the continuum level. Uh, today, I won't be talking about orientation of particles, but just their density. So I'll be talking about scalar models, which have a wide applicability in this uh, field of phase separation that I will be focusing on. Okay, so a feature of uh, such active systems uh, is shown in this movie here. This is an asymmetric cog immersed in a bath of bacteria, and you will see that it rotates in a definite direction. So uh, without the cog, if you were looking at these bacteria, you'd find that they were just doing random motions and the individual one would follow some kind of smoothed out or um, finite step length Brownian path. But the, the microscopic irreversibility of these active systems shows up at the large scale here. Um, so in active matter, the time reversal symmetry in the microscopic dynamics is always broken. Whether it's broken at the macroscopic scale or how much it's broken at the macroscopic scale, which is one of the things we'll be quantifying later on, is a, is varies from system to system and uh, under different conditions. So here it's the combination of a, of a, um, a helical object, so an object which breaks rotational symmetry um, and with the microscopic irreversibility that allows that ratchet behavior to be seen. So circulating uh, currents is, a, is a, a major feature of active matter systems. Um, and here is a, by now a, a classical movie of self-propelled colloidal particles undergoing a phase separation. These particles have repulsive interactions. Uh, when they are uh, self-propelling, which is, uh, this is light activated, so these particular particles self-propel when uh, the light is turned on. Uh, if you turn the light off, you can see that they just turn into ordinary Brownian particles and those structures collapse. So you saw there, there was actually crystallinity in those clusters. I won't talk about that today, but the concept of uh, this motility induced phase separation lies behind all of the examples that I will be mentioning. Um, this is not a movie. At least it doesn't work as a movie anymore, something wrong with my PowerPoint. But anyway, this is a snapshot of what happens uh, in a computer simulation, the same uh, uh, physics of motility induced phase separation, obviously a much, much larger number of particles. And the time evolution of this is, is like the standard coarsening of a, uh, of a liquid vapor phase separation. So this is for active Brownian particles, which many of you know exactly what they are, but just a, a type of a self propelling particle of computational convenience. So, uh, just a little background to MIPS then, motility induced phase separation. So, it's a type of phase separation that happens far from thermal equilibrium in general. Um, and it's based on the idea that particles accumulate in regions where they move slowly and they also move slowly in regions where they've accumulated. So, it's that feedback loop which leads to the instability in the phase separation. So that scenario is by now very extensively confirmed by computer simulations, uh, particularly in these repulsive active Brownian particle systems. Uh, in experiments, uh, something closely resembling MIPS is certainly seen, but it's complicated because you have, uh, particularly in these uh, autophoretic colloids, you have uh, uh, interactions that maybe, well, are long range because of the interaction between the colloids and the diffusing chemicals and so on. And one of the features that is seen is that the phase separation can arrest at a finite length scale where you see uh, clusters, cluster phases uh, in steady state. So the, the phase separation reaches a certain scale and then I've got a set of dynamical clusters that are exchanging material but they're not getting any bigger. So there's a big experimental literature on that as well. So that's all setting the background for the kinds of uh, continuum theory I now want to talk about. And then having set up those theories, I'll start uh, focusing on a discussion of entropy production in, in the setting of particles and then these continuum theories. Okay, so let's turn to the kind of uh, scalar field theories that uh, we've been using in my group uh, for uh, seven or eight years now. Um, and they're based on the, the idea, uh, which uh, has certainly been 
developed before in the context of um, orientational order rather than just the phase separation of a scalar. The idea is that you start with uh, a model that you already understand, which is an equilibrium model, a model of passive, in our case, passive phase separation. Um, and then you add to it minimally the terms that represent activity, and they do that by breaking the uh, detailed balance structure or the time reversibility of the theory that you start from. So uh, the theory that we start from is model B. So this is the diffusive dynamics of a conserved scalar field. The scalar field is called phi. Uh, we choose just by convention, phi is able to have negative and positive values. So if you think of it, you can think of it as a composition variable, something which is, uh, if you've got two species, A and B, it's the difference in densities of the A and B species, or up to just a shift, it could be just the density of some active particles. Anyway, it's a scalar, and um, we don't have birth and death in this model, so that the time derivative of the scalar field phi is the divergence of a current J. And J uh, in the passive system has this kind of structure. It's proportional to the gradient of a chemical potential. Um, there's a mobility factor there, which I've set to one. And it has a noise term, which is uh, governed by the fluctuation dissipation theorem here. So lambda is a unit white vector noise, and the diffusion constant D is related to the mobility by the usual factor of KT. The chemical potential that's chosen in model B is written down here. And in the case of negative A, you have a phase separation. Uh, this chemical potential, as many of you know, stems from the standard phi four theory or square gradient uh, free energy. So mu is a df by d phi. Uh, here's the expression for the, the uh, free energy of the system and an integral over volume of, of a, a local free energy density, which is uh, a quartic polynomial. Negative A gives you the local two world structure, which is shown on the right here, and a square gradient term, which leads to the, the Laplacian term in the chemical potential. So we know everything about this model. In particular, we know what its steady states are, um, namely that if the uh, quadratic coefficient A is negative, you have two wells in the local free energy and the system will phase separate uh, in general via the common tangent rule in this simple case of a symmetric, uh, completely symmetric model. That's just this horizontal green line here. So if I choose a density, say, uh, for the composition variable, say, around zero, it will phase separate into positive and negative regions given by the two minima of this free energy curve that you see on the right. Those are the binodals, the minima, uh, with relative amounts of each phase that are fixed by the global composition, which is conserved. And in general, the uh, conditions for phase equilibrium, uh, are the, the equality of chemical potential in the two phases and also the equality of thermodynamic pressure, which uh, in a system like this is mu phi minus F. So those are defined in the bulk phases and they're both equal in both phases and that gives you this construction. Um, so what we do is um, activize this. So we add to the chemical potential, a term which is written down here, lambda grad phi squared, uh, this defines active model B. Uh, it's not the only term you can add. I'll come back to that in a minute. Um, but the key point about this is that that additional term there isn't uh, derivable from a free energy. It's not the, the appropriate derivative, functional derivative of any free energy functional. So this breaks the free energy structure behind the uh, dynamics of model B, and that is enough to break time reversal symmetry. And if you're not quite clear why, the best thing is to wait, because I'm going to prove that this model has a steady entropy production in steady state, so it cannot have time, it cannot be an equilibrium model. Um, generally, if you break the free energy, something goes wrong with the idea of the Boltzmann distribution for obvious reasons. Anyway, that's the uh, simplest way to break time reversal symmetry or detailed balance in a continuum field theory of this type. 
and I'm just trying to get control of the slides again. Yeah, uh, let me, yeah, okay. Um, so uh, interesting thing, things happen even uh, by adding that simple term there. The first one is that uh, the condition for phase coexistence is changed. So in bulk phases, I've only added to the chemical potential here um, a gradient term. So the, 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 in each of the bulk phases, I can calculate this chemical potential. They still have to be equal because otherwise there would be a current because the current flows down the gradient of the chemical potential. But the, the pressure-like object, which in the um, passive system is the thermodynamic pressure, mu phi minus F, is not equal. And you can calculate how unequal it is by setting up a one-dimensional interface. So it's um, you know, an extension of the classic calculation for model B. Uh, there's no current so that the chemical potential is the same and you just look for a current free solution that has zero gradients plus minus infinity. And you find that because of that extra lambda term, it isn't the usual one. So this is somewhat peculiar because in, if I forget about fluctuations for a minute, in each of the bulk phases, I have a, I have a, a, a free energy like structure because the gradients are zero. So the lambda terms couldn't care whether it's there or not yet. The, the coexistence is shifted so that the system is nowhere near its free energy minimum. But the only place that the lambda term matters is near the interface. So somehow that lambda term does something in the neighborhood of the interface where it's big that is capable of pushing the system miles out of equilibrium. And um, uh, one way of thinking about that is saying it's working there. It's doing work. It's pushing the density against the free energy uh, and we'll see how that shows up at the very end of the talk. Okay, so that's um, active model B. Um, so this non-standard phase separation or what we could call anomalous phase coexistence is well established as a principle. Uh, there's not direct, you know, the, that active model is a bit abstract. It doesn't directly map to a specific experimental system, but there are experimental systems uh, and numerical systems based on particles of various types, which I won't go into, uh, that you can, uh, Sriram has raised his hand. So, Sriram. Hi, uh, can you hear me? Yes. Uh, so, um, uh, the graphite squared term, of course, not only breaks time reversal, it breaks uh, an artificial symmetry that the model started with of phi going minus phi. Yes, it does. So um, the, have you looked at what happens if you preserve that while breaking TRS? Um, interesting question. The, uh, the, the, yes, um, not, not directly. Remember, though, that if you um, have an, the, the normal way to break that symmetry would be to add a cubic term. A linear terms irrelevant because it integrates to to a constant, and you know that if you add the cubic term, you can just re-expand the phi four theory about a different critical point, and it, everything is the same to phi four order. So, yeah, I, so, I, be, I, so at the critical point, you'll still be symmetric, but uh, yes. coexistence. I mean, you know, overall coexistence won't be between two kind of equivalent phases. No. Yeah. Uh, anyway, yeah. You're, I mean, you're right, but it, but the effect of lambda, it, obviously, it certainly does break the phi minus phi symmetry, but um, that doesn't explain the shift of the phase boundaries mm. because it's in the gradient. So the, the 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 normal way of calculating the phase boundaries doesn't involve the gradient. It's the common common tangent construction on f. Right. Okay. Well, maybe I'll so, think more about it. yeah. So it's... So I could, uh, okay, uh, what I'm saying, I think, is that I could find a, a, a gradient term that breaks phi minus phi symmetry, but doesn't break detail balance. And right. it would definitely, it would certainly have no effect on the phase boundaries. True. Okay. Okay, go ahead, go on. Thanks. Right. So uh, anomalous phase separation in that sense is a real thing. Um, that model, as I've described it, doesn't describe uh, cluster phases. There is something missing, and it took us a year or two to figure this out, and it's this term here. So this looks a little bit complicated. This is now called active model B+. plus. It's of the same order in gradients and phi's as the lambda term. It sits directly in the current equation, and for that reason that we now don't have the structure of J being the gradient of anything. 
So the current can now have a curl. So if I wanted to have a, a continuum model that showed the type of thing I showed with the cog, so a circulating macroscopic current, I do need this term. Uh, I should say though that this term vanishes in one dimension um, for the same general reason as curls don't exist in one dimension. So um, what's interesting is when you do add this term, and I won't go into the details, you do end up with cluster phases. You now get, uh, uh, th this model is a big enough model. It breaks time reversal symmetry in two different ways. You have shifted phase coexistence on one side and you have cluster phases on the other. So here's a movie of, uh, uh, this is now phase coexistence in state, steady state, obviously there's periodic boundary conditions here, between a big droplet in which you find uh, little bubbles of vapor. So the vapor is dark, the droplet is bright. Um, and you could see from the steady state there that that has droplets that are, are bubbles that are forming in the bulk of this big uh, 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 liquid droplet pop out at the edge. So this is a, a manifestation of time reversal asymmetry at the, at least the mesoscale, the scale of what you see in that movie. Um, this is, a, as, as, as shown here, this is a, the, the um, orange droplet with the, the void bubbles in it is a bubble phase, but in fact the whole model as uh, Sriram identified is not symmetric if you just flip phi to minus phi, if at the same time though you change the sign of the activity parameters it is. So I can just reinterpret this um, movie here is showing a uh, droplet of liquid containing a cluster phase, which are these dark objects here, um, then surrounded by a dense uh, phase. So that would be a coexistence between a cluster phase and excess dense uh, liquid. So um, as I hope to persuade you there with just talking about the motion of the individual droplets, this has uh, manifested time reversal symmetry to a large scale. So I now want to talk about quantification of time reversal symmetry, and to that uh, end we'll turn to stochastic thermodynamics first for a particle and then for fields. So here's a Langevin equation. This describes an overdamped particle, single coordinate x, uh, it's in a potential v, has a mobility m, and uh, lambda is the ubiquitous unit white noise, d again is mkt. Um, so we know the statistics of the noise. It's this Gaussian object P of lambda sitting here in the middle of your screen. And from it, we can calculate the uh, probability of any trajectory X of T and also any the, the time reversal of the same trajectory. So we define a trajectory X of T, calculate its probability density from uh, by basically solving that equation for given noise, calculate the probability for the reversed path which differs between numerator and denominator just by the sign change in x dot here. And a crucial, the, the only real big result of stochastic thermodynamics we need is that object is the exponential of the entropy change of the universe, if you like, divided by KB. So that's the, the delta S here, if you like, is the entropy that is uh, the heat that goes out into the heat bath that is providing the white noise as a result of the motion of this particle. From which follows the second law, but it follows in this much more microscopic way, hence stochastic in the title of the slide. Um, if I look at T delta S, uh, I, I uh, have these exponentials, the, the, the squared terms vanish above and below, all of those. The only thing I'm left with is cross terms. We have two of them on the top, two with a minus sign on the bottom. There's a four out of the front here. So I end up with this integral, x dot dv by dt, which is of course a total derivative and is basically just reestablishing the second law that the uh, heat uh, which goes out into the bath is equal to the difference in the initial and final values of the potential that the particle is sitting in. So that's the, the second law, it's also the first law. So that's how, it, uh, how this works for a particle. If I put the same particle now, uh, I subject it to a non-conservative force, which I'm going to call F. So I add an extra force F, do, it, do the same thing. Well, now I can now think about a steady state entropy production because um, there's no reason. The, if, I, if I calculate the, uh, the heat put out into the bath over a very long time interval, so T2 minus T1, which I'm going to take to infinity, there's no reason 
for this uh, time average heat production to vanish now. It has two pieces uh, from, if I, if I take an average of it, it has two pieces from the, the calculation I've described. Uh, I have got an extra bit in the cross term, which is an X dot F. The bit which is from the change in the potential, so the conservative part is killed off by taking the denominator to be large here. So in steady state, unsurprisingly, the heat that is put out into the bath is the rate of working X dot F averaged over the noise uh, of the non-conservative force. So for this particle then, the steady state entropy production or thermodynamic entropy production is a measure of irreversibility because in steady state it only picks up the non-conservative part of the force. It quantifies the heat flow and those two things are the same statement because of this result that I wrote down, exponential delta S is log blah blah, which is a way of writing one of the fluctuation theorems that are the cornerstone of stochastic thermodynamics. So there's a fantastic review article on this whole subject by Udo Seifert 2012 for anyone who's seeing this for the first time. Fields. So we can do the same thing for fields. So suppose I take uh, a, a, a passive, a model B, in which the scalar field is a mixture of A and B molecules, say. So here's my scalar field, phi. Uh, here's the equations, phi dot is minus div J, J gradient chemical potential. There's now a spatio-temporal white noise. There's still a connection between the diffusion, the, the noise coefficient and the mobility here. Uh, so the direct counterpart of the previous calculation is that the positive and negative path probabilities are proportional to this object with plus or minus j for forward and backward paths. So I can just uh, mirror the single particle calculation at the field level. And um, in the absence of a non-conservative term here, I get uh, essentially the same result. T delta S, KT times the log of the ratio of these two things. In that ratio, all of the squared terms vanish. I get twice the cross term in the numerator, minus twice the cross term in the denominator, which cancels the four. And the four then cancels the, the D then cancels the M. So by the time I finished, I get this, J dot grad DFD phi. And that's a total derivative. It's telling me the difference in the free energy of the system between the initial and the final state. So here's the second law again derived this way and contains the first law in conservation of energy as well. But that's a passive system. The active system has the counterpart of my F, of my uh, non conservative force. And that's this Y here. So active model B or B plus have a thing sitting in the current equation that I can think of as a sort of driving, so a forcing term, exactly the same calculation as before. I get a J dot Y cross term here, twice on top, twice beneath, canceling the four. And so if I look at the steady state entropy production of this now active field theory, it has J dot Y time average integration over space. Um, and I can think of that as a, as a work term, if you want. If I think of Y as a force and then it creates a current, then this is indeed uh, the, the work done by that force-like object. And again, the integrable term, which is the J D, uh, grad DFT phi, uh, is killed off by taking the long time limit here. Uh, may so I ask I'm a in... question? Yes, please. Yeah, uh, shouldn't you also incorporate the first line by a delta function or they just cancel in the forward and the reverse part when you take the ratio? This phi dot equal to minus del dot j. Uh, yes, so I've written it. Okay, you're quite right. I mean, I could write this with only phi or phi dot. Um, j, uh, I've written it with j, yes, but I can actually, sub I can invert this equation if you want me to put inverse of this operator on phi here. It's a bit of a technicality. I can write this. So I can, I can if you want to substitute, um, uh, I, can, I can exchange this j for a phi dot by partial integrations if I want to. Okay. So I then get something like uh, phi dot grad y okay. with, with a fine with sign change or phi dot div y. 
So th this whole thing has to be a scalar, of course, and I can indeed write it as, so in the, in the equilibrium case, I could write it as J grad mu, or I could write it as phi dot times mu. And the same is true here. I can either write it as J dot Y or phi dot times some operator on Y. Is there another question? Okay. Right. Oh, that was definitely the wrong thing. It's taken me back to the beginning, excuse me. Oh no, it hasn't. Here, now, um, that was the right thing. So I was there. Um, yeah, so I missed one slide. Uh, that's the forcing term. Okay. Uh, okay, I'm here. Right. So let's now think about this. But I want to think about this first very far from equilibrium because you'll see that something has gone a bit wrong in my presentation here. And the thing that's gone wrong is that the, if I talk about a system for which we might use active model B, but which is, you know, grossly nowhere near thermal equilibrium. So sheep goat phase separation, say. So here's sheep goat phase separation. Um, so those are my scalar particles and that uh, mixed flock might phase separate. And if it did so, then a, a legitimate first attempt at a continuum model of this would be active model B because I have a composition variable. I have basically diffusive dynamics and I'm not tracking the orientation of individual particles. So suppose that was the case, that there's my phi field defined in terms of the de number density of sheep and goats. Well, it's clear that even if I have in any kind of um, Landau-like sort of gradient expansion, I have this structure because this expression for J is the lowest order thing I can make out of the field and its gradients. And I can always think of that as a piece which is integrable in the sense that if I, you know, put that into the calculation, I get a total derivative and a, 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 a force which is not, a, a piece which is not, and a noise. But in general, and certainly for sheep and goats, this F is not a free energy. It's just something which says I'm approximating the behavior by a polynomial in phi and some square gradient terms. Uh, and the noise is not thermal noise. Nonetheless, I can still mathematically define the object that I was studying just now, um, which is this uh, entropy production like quantity. And to just to say, admit that there's no connection with uh, heat flow anymore, we call, call this now the informatic entropy production, a suggestion of uh, Christian Mays to distinguish these two quantities more clearly. Okay, so that's fine. Uh, so I can quantify the irreversibility of a model like active model B in a context independent way with no reference to thermodynamics by still looking at this object, which is, is telling me about the irreversibility because it's telling me about the relative probabilities of forward and backward paths. And the other interesting comment is that this is the spatial integral of an object which in a system like phase separation where I have a stable interface between two phases, the time average of this object here, I can think of as a local entropy production and it's got spatial structure. Uh, so the key can point I, though, can, yes, can I ask a question? Yes. Yeah. Uh, is it evident that like in terms, in this kind of non-equilibrium dynamics, you will always have a reverse part? I mean, there might be some cases where you might have a forward part, but the corresponding reverse path need not exist, right? Well, that would be true, and that would correspond to f equals zero. Okay. Uh, the the point I would make there is, if you have anything in the 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 current which is the gradient of a polynomial in phi, mm -hmm. that's integral. It's only at the level of gradient terms in f that it isn't. So, if you if you just want diffusion, simple diffusion. That's mm -hmm. integrable. Yes. So it would be a, quite a peculiar model that didn't have any integrable terms at all. I mean, like in terms of some microscopic dynamics, I can always think of some active dynamics where the, I guess, the reverse path doesn't exist, I guess, right? Well, uh, okay. Uh, I, I think I can uh, help with that point. Uh, the splitting of this J into integrable and not isn't unique. And we're perfectly legitimate to say, well, the right-hand side is not integrable because it's got a Y in it. Mm -hmm. And therefore I can just put everything that's in the 
uh, the what I'm calling the integral part, I could I could put that in y if I wanted to. But when I get to this point, it'll be a total derivative, so it won't contribute. Do you see what I mean? Yeah, but on the other hand, in terms of the path probabilities, if the uh, reverse path doesn't exist, then the probability is zero, right? So in, in some sense, you will say the entropy production is infinity or but zero. That, and that's, a, that's a good point. And that's very relevant for uh, models with say birth and death, yeah. where the reverse path may not exist. Yeah. Um, and that's something that you know we have uh, research going on in various ways. But okay. in this type of model, where you yeah. have a conserved density, mm -hmm. um, it's uh, you'd have to work very hard to get a a, a a a zero weight for a reverse path because normally that would be attached to some kind of discrete process which only goes in one direction. Yeah. Okay. If, if the overall picture is a, a, a you know fluctuating diffusive field with some forcing then mm -hmm. um, the reverse path is maybe very unlikely, but is not impossible. Okay. Yeah. Uh, Mike, one small interruption. If you had particles whose movement was entirely because of their self-propulsion and whose changes in direction were only because their self-propelling direction changed, they didn't have any usual additive running noise, then you could have situations where the only way it reversed would be to turn around and not if it shuffled backward, you see what I mean? Like, if you took active non particles without uh, positional noise, it's very good to get things that sort of possible. Yeah, but what I do know is if you take active branding particles with any kind of interaction, mm -hmm. I get terms which look integrable at this level. Because, I mean, in other words, we can do the coarse graining explicitly for active branding particles with a, a density dependent speed or with collisions. Mm -hmm. And you always get something which looks, which is, because to get, to get a phase separation, you need to have terms in this equation which look like a two weld structure in, in, in what I'm calling the free energy part. Mm, and, okay. and and so they will they, they, to get the phase separation. Then, then you, I don't think you can drive a phase separation purely with gradient terms at the level of this. Right. So, so I'm distinguishing between what's going on microscopically, and I'll do this more thoroughly in a minute, and what is visible at the level of this kind of coarse grain description. And at this level, I can always I I can pick off pieces that are integrable, mm. and. Uh, uh, I don't have to, for the reason I've just said that they, they'll give me no contribution to this S anyway. Um, and, uh, but it is still ambiguous as to which, you know, what I consider driving and what I consider free energy like. And in particular, in the case of sheep and goats, I have no guidance at all from the okay. microscopics. And what I want to do uh, after, um, in a slide or two, is to think about systems where we can write this equation with some confidence about what we might mean by F as a free energy. All right, okay. Okay, so I can define this informatic entropy production, which is no longer connected directly to thermodynamics or heat flow. It only is connected if that F is indeed a proper free energy, if D is indeed thermal noise, and also if Y is a proper force, not something to do with the psychology of sheep. Because uh, to get this to work in the in the full thermodynamic sense, I need a first law as well as a second law. So I have to be able to think of J dot Y as something which has an energetic uh, value to it. Okay. Okay, so just let me uh, continue then. So if you look at phase separation, what you see here, uh, you can look at this local entropy production density. And you find that in the bulk phases, it is proportional to D, which is the noise amplitude. It develops, if you like, a deterministic piece at the interface. And this connects back with what I was saying before, that the uh, that um, non-integral lambda term is doing something quite strong at the interface. Firstly, OK, the interface is where grad phi squared is big, but also this is where things are happening in terms of uh, irreversible physics. And uh, you can think of that as you know, this, the, what's happening to the fluctuations at different places. Bulk fluctuations are doing one thing, fluctuations near the interface are doing another. And that's the way the um, irreversibility shows up. But I'll have more to say about this in a minute. So uh, there's generic scaling for this informatic EPR. Um, if, it, if I have dynamics which breaks time reversal symmetry at deterministic level, which this doesn't, because once I've phase separated, the system is static. So that if I look at a static movie, I can't tell whether it's running forwards or backwards. I don't have uh, visible time reversal symmetry. So 
but in, in flocks and things, I can easily get d to the minus one here. Uh, d to the zero means that the leading order fluctuations are uh, breaking reversibility and d higher powers, something higher order. So here we're getting a distinction between the interface and the bulk as to, uh, in the scaling, as to what the fluctuations are doing. Okay. So I want to uh, move on now to the last part. Uh, and this is this distinction between thermodynamic and informatic entropy production. So the point then is that if I actually look at a system of sheep and goats and I ask what is the heat production, well, this is uh, obviously not dominated by whether the sheep and goat are phase separated. It is dominated by essentially the kind of roughly, uh, well, I estimate about 100 watts uh, metabolism of an animal the size of a sheep. Um, so, you know, human beings are also roughly 100 watts in calorie consumption. Um, so the full entropy production, if you were um, concerned by it, is got nothing to do with, you know, phase coexistence or the macroscopic dynamics that we might be interested in from a physics point of view. So not only is it misguided uh, to calculate it, it's impossible and it's not interesting. Um, the informatic one is still interesting because it's telling us about whether the macroscopic dynamics is reversible or not, and where it's reversible and how reversible and irreversible it is as I vary the noise level. So that's interesting. But what I want to do in the last part of the talk is turn to something like phase separation inside a cell, where I might well hope that a free energy structure is, is you know, something I can properly think about. In other words, the system is close enough to equilibrium that to talk about the integral part of some equations of motion as stemming from free energy is sensible. Um, so the, the um, full uh, entropy production will be bigger than the informatic one because the, the coarse grain model throws away some microscopic dynamics. Um, but the distinction I want to make here is that if I look at the coarse grain dynamics with this active term at the informatic level, um, the, 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 to make that honest, I have to at least think a bit about what sort of underlying processes, metabolic, chemical, whatever, give rise to these active terms. So I've got two entropy productions I can think about. One is just the coarse grain dynamics, self-contained. The other is, uh, in a minimal way, adding some sort of chemical background process that allows the, the drive terms to arise. So I then have two distinct possible entropy productions. The full one will certainly be bigger than the informatic one, and how do we relate them? So that's what I wish to talk about for the final part of my presentation. So uh, this is uh, this topic here. Um, just for background, um, Oh, do I? I don't. I thought I had a slide on membraneless organelles. I do. Yeah. Okay. So uh, this is the way we're going to think about this system. I have an active system which lives in the middle here, and if I was thinking, sorry, excuse me, I've just lost my shared screen. Yes. Okay. Uh, so I have an active system. It's got fuel. It's got products. It's convenient to think of those as physically separated. So if you had a thin layer, you could do this. Uh, it's not essential, but it's conceptually useful. So I'm interested in the dynamics in here, but I'm conscious that there's some chemical potential difference which is driving the active terms. And we know what this looks like in many models, uh, including um, active liquid crystals. So, uh, so there's a heat coming out. So suppose I'm interested in this system which is close to equilibrium, but weakly driven by some chemical reactions, say. And a case where this might be relevant is this uh, topic of membraneless organelles. So I'm not presenting this as a, as a model of membraneless organelles. I'm just saying there are systems in which a liquid-liquid-like phase separation inside a cell leads to the formation of, of you know, functioning bits of the cell called organelles. They don't have a membrane right them, around them, which is why they thought of in terms of phase separation. And there's a, about a dozen different types of these things that have now been identified as uh, connected with a, a or, or um, rationalized by biophysics uh, experimental people in terms of um, a, 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 a phase separation in an active system. Um, and here's let's see if I can get yes. So uh, this is these are stress granules which appear in this. I'm not quite sure what cells these are. Um, the cells are put under stress, 
and you get this phase separation into these little blobs, which do some then kind of uh, coalescence and so on. And then if you take the stress away, uh, they disappear. So, um, so anyway, there's this whole uh, literature about this type of subject. So then the question is whether if we're trying to think of this in the, in the simplest possible terms from a physics point of view, what would we do? Well, we'd actually we'd arrive at active model B or B plus because that is the minimal way of adding anything which is a kind of um, local chemical driving to the phase separation of a scalar field. And by the way, the fact that these um, uh, granules are uh, limited in size is, I think, related to the cluster phases. And uh, therefore, you'd say, well, we probably need active B plus to say anything useful about this were we to address this as a modeling exercise. But I'm not going to address it as a modeling exercise. I'm going to address it as a fundamental question about how to understand the heat production here. So we have a chemical drive, which for a cell may be the chemical potential difference of ATP and ADP, it's positive. Um, we'll take the simplest case, binary, binary uh, symmetric binary mixture, as we've said before. We need to introduce a, a chemical coordinate, a, like a local reaction coordinate, which tracks um, how much chemistry has happened. So that can be a function of space and time. I'm going to call it N as a local kind of reaction coordinate. So the point is that the, uh, in, in the, such a system, if it's close to equilibrium, it has to have this structure of linear irreversible thermodynamics. So the, the, the current J of the phase separation and the chemical rate of change N have to be uh, related by a linear Onsager matrix, which has the Onsager symmetries to the driving forces, which are the gradient of the chemical potential of particle of, of the phase separation, which I'm leaving that as DF by D phi, not to be confused with mu, which I'm now reserving for the chemical drive, delta mu, and there are noise terms. So uh, we know the equation for J because I told it to you. Uh, so active model B, for instance, has this form and B plus, there's a drive term Y. So I now identify that as an off diagonal piece of that Onsager system. So Y is delta mu times something, which is a vector G. So G is an off diagonal Onsager coupling. And we know from the symmetry of the Onsager matrix, just the fundamentals of near equilibrium, linearized, nonlinear thermodynamics, that that fixes the off diagonal term in the chemical equation, which is this N dot equation here. So having chosen, for instance, active model B as the uh, model for J, I then don't separately have a choice about what the chemical equation looks like. So this is written down here. There's a couple of technical consequences of this, which are actually quite interesting. One is that the noise terms for the current and the chemical equation are correlated. So what I've called lambda up here and lambda prime here are not independent, they're correlated. Uh, off diagonal noise ends up being multiplicative. So that, that actually, if you start looking closely at these equations, it can become quite complicated. Nonetheless, the, the, the basics of what's happening is quite simple and I'll try to stick to that in what follows. Notice when I say linear, I don't mean linear in phi, I mean linear in delta mu. So these are very, very nonlinear equations. It's just that I'm identifying the activity as being uh, driven by a small change in the chemical potential of ATP, ADP or whatever. Okay. So I can write down Gysi from that on Tugerson to calculate the full entropy production. And it has a very obvious and simple form because the only place that um, energy, if you like, is coming into the system is through the chemicals. So it's N dot delta mu. That all ends up as heat somehow in steady state. That is just the rate of chemical working and is just the, the direct counterpart of X dot F for the Langevin particle. So at first sight, that looks quite boring. But actually, this object has non-trivial spatial dependence. And it does that because the end dot equation has phi in it, which is here. Yeah. Okay, so y is my drive term. Here's the end dot equation. I've substitute. I can substitute the current equation back into here, and then that breaks down the full to, the total ent ent entropy production of this chemical system coupled to phi 
And I can identify a piece which is exactly the informatic piece that is only dependent on the coarse grained phi variables, doesn't care at all about what, you know, the, the, the feet of the duck paddling under the water, which is the chemistry. Uh, there's a piece which is just a gigantic constant, which basically says wherever I look, there's chemistry going on. But there's also a modulation of that constant, which is this term here. So this is part of the chemical piece, uh, or these two things together, if you like, are the, the non-informatic uh, uh, um, piece. Uh, and the, by the way, this, this uh, pair of terms here, these two, there's a minus sign here, but this is always positive in total uh, via the positivity of the Ponsarga matrix. If I go find a system where this has become negative, then I'm not in linear thermodynamics, the Ponsarga description has broken down. So here, finally, uh, this is just for the simplest case, active model B. I know the form of the Y term, it's lambda grad, grad phi squared. I told you before that the I informatic entropy production has this behavior, it has a big peak, which scales like D to the zero at the interface uh, and is D to the one in the bulk. And if I look at this chemical term, I've got this gigantic constant part, which I say it's gigantic because um, there's a one over D here, a one over T and a one over D. So this is a, uh, a irreversible process, the chemistry that does not go away, even in a uniform system that's always happening. So that's where my D to the minus one is. I've got a systematic uh, big flux, a chemical flux. And so it scales like D to the minus one, but it depends on phi. And it depends on phi, this little hand-drawn sketch here, excuse me for not getting this properly drawn up. And red here is my informatic entropy production, D to the one in the bulk, D to the zero at the interface. And here is my chemical contribution. And you see, okay, it's hugely bigger, D to the minus one, and it's got these dips, order one in its own units at the interface. That's what this ends up looking like. So we don't really understand this yet. I think my message is that it's interesting. So it's interesting because what's going on at this interface, it's, it's, it seems to be saying that, okay, the heat production, which has got to come from the chemistry, uh, is not happening, at least on the two sides of the interface. And why not? Well, that must be because the chemistry is working hard there. It must be pushing the phi field up its free energy. There's nowhere else for this uh, heat, the, for the work input n dot delta mu to go. So I think that's what this means, that the chemistry is working locally against F. Of course, it gets lost. I mean, the, the, the chemical work is dissipated eventually in steady state, but not at the interface. It's dissipated by the diffusive current, because I think, what, I think what's happening is that this is telling us about in the offset of the phase separation. I told you the phase separation is displaced. The, the coexisting densities are not the ones that the free energy would like. So that means that this active term must be acting as a pump across the interface, in which case it's doing work. It's pumping things up the free energy. And of course, they're flowing back uh, by a diffusive current somehow. So I think that's what's going on. And I think um, what the, the message is here then is that the looking at the informatic entropy production is interesting, but looking at this extension in a minimal extension to uh, a, a chemical cause of the activity is also interesting and adds a new layer of information about uh, how to think about you know, where the system is, is being irreversible uh, in, in terms of its uh, spatial layout. Okay, so to conclude quickly, um, I've, so the, 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 the main thing I was trying to focus on today was the stochastic thermodynamics of, um, act, of you know, continuous field theory models for active systems. And my claim is that it's me mechanistically informative in the way that can quantify irreversibility, in particular, this um, uh, spatially resolved version of it. Um, if I'm interested in, if you like, macroscopic active matter, so large animals or whatever, um, and I think also bacteria in terms of their motion. Um, the informatic entropy production is useful, it's calculable, it's got nothing to do with heat flow. The full entropy production, were I able to do it, would not be useful and isn't calculable anyway. And compared to the entropy production 
uh, at the informatic level, say for a sheep goat phase separation, it's basically infinite. If I have a system that's sufficiently microscopic that I can think of the activity as being a near equilibrium process, which of course may not be true in, in, in uh, many subcellular situations, but that's the place where it might be true. Then the uh, actual heat production is very simple if I think in terms of the chemistry, but because of the way the, chemi the chemical uh, process is coupled via the Onsaga matrix to the actual behavior of the, 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 the field of interest in the phase separation, um, I get much more information than just saying this is big. Um, it's because I, I showed you that the this the full thing can be written as the informatic part plus something which is positive, so it's a lower bound. It's not a useful lower bound in the sense that generally the chemical terms will be massively bigger, but nonetheless each of the bits that I can identify uh, as the informatic part and the chemical part, each is interesting. It quantifies a different aspect of the local irreversibility that's going on in the system when described in those terms. And thank you very much for your attention. I apologize for uh, using up almost the entire time speaking. Thanks, Professor Cates, for a wonderful talk. Um, Shiram uh, has raised his hand, but before that, Prashant had a question. Um, Prashant, would you like to go ahead? <coughs> Shiram, it'll be you after this. Yes, sure. Prashant, are you there? Yeah, yeah. So, so, so I was asking like uh, the field equations that you showed in the initial part of your talk, are they derivable for some known microscopic models of active particles? Uh, that's an excellent question. So if you think about the 5-4 theory as say a model of liquid vapor separation, uh, of course it's not really derivable. What you get if you do a, a microscopic um, uh, coarse graining of the passive model, instead of a phi squared and B phi fourth, you get rho log rho and rho squared from the interactions. And then of course you go to the critical point, you expand and you get it that way. The important thing for us is not so much that, that part because uh, we can certainly get a rho log rho type theory of the active system and we could do that by explicit coarse graining. Um, the, the, the interesting question is the, the lambda term or the, the, the active terms. And indeed the, the Lambda term is uh, the first thing you see if you expand for a set of interacting particles whose um, propulsion speed depends on their density. You get a square gradient term and you do get a lambda piece. If you want to get my second active term, which I call zeta, then it turns out that you need to have both um, a uh, density dependent propulsion speed and something more like a conventional uh, collisional interaction. So either collisions or density dependent speed can give you the phase separation. If you want to get both of the uh, active terms in the gradients, then you need uh, both of those to be present. But I wouldn't say one is connected to one and the other to the other. Thank you very much. Thanks, Prashant. Uh, Shiram? Yeah, hi. Um... An interesting intermediate case, uh, not as sort of not completely dominated by metabolism like animals and not uh, just, you know, not only the informatic production would be if you had, let's say, a vibrated granular system of discs. Mm -hmm. uh, and maybe these discs, I mean, you could endow each disc with a block, with a set of pulsion mechanism, but it could even be discs that tilt and move. So, you know, each disc doesn't have a permanent vector on it. Uh, it has a transient vector so to which way it moves. And there'll be a part of the irreversibility that has to do with uh, losing kinetic energy by colliding. And then there'll be a pure configuration part where you forget the velocities, right? Mm -hmm. And it's, in, it's even possible yes. that in some limit, the pure configuration sum is practically equilibrium hard disks and shows no informatic EPR. Mm. And uh, so you, you could imagine systems of that sort. So I wonder uh, if there's a yeah, calculation that's, that's, to be done there. That, that's very interesting. So, okay. So, um, okay. So I think what you're saying is that if you think of this last part uh, in that uh, setting, 
mm -hmm. the, you know, the counterpart of the chemical stuff yeah it's just would, be, would, be, repla would be replaced by kinetic energy and you're putting right. stuff into the kinetic energy yes yeah. okay but well, I mean, okay. By, just by elastic collisions and no other yeah, yeah, yeah. nothing fancier and resupply so, yeah so i think that's a very interesting suggestion because you know that that may be as i think what you're saying that might be simple enough to to get a sort of description which does have both pieces uh you know uh described Candidly, in, yeah, in, a, yeah. in, a, in a credible way yeah and to, to see whether they they interact in a similar manner to this um yeah that is interesting yeah but i don't think you'd expect that to have an onsaga theorem do you yeah probably not i mean i but, but, but I think what what you'd hope to do is rather than rely on the onsaga symmetry because the thing the thing which was the, I mean the key step in what I've just presented at the end here was to to realize that having chosen the the active equation for the field then the chemistry is now fixed by the onsaga yeah absolutely but yeah. of course if you didn't have onsaga but you had a model for instance mm -hmm. a simple enough description of um, energy coming in through the kinetic energy and leaving through friction uh, then uh, one might be able to construct uh, the equivalent of the end-dot equation explicitly as a coarse graining of some mm -hmm. interesting microscopic model. So that's definitely yeah, that's the thought. Yeah, 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 yeah. Thanks. Thanks. Um, are there any other questions? Uh, Mahesh has a question. Mahesh, hi. Good afternoon, Professor Gates. Uh, that is Mahesh. I'm from Okinawa, Japan, but currently in India. Uh, I had a, a question that comes from the dynamical systems standpoint. Mm -hmm. As we know, the sum of the Lyapunov exponents uh, in, in this system of active or passive particles uh, would, would equal the entropy production rate. Uh, I would, I'm not theoretically trained, uh, but I would imagine at least intuition suggests that the argument that the sum of the Lyapunov exponents equals the entropy production rate would hold for active systems as well. But in light of the uh, proposal that Sriram just made about uh, hard disks, uh, where the configura uh, configurationally they might uh, be seen as an equilibrium system, but due to frictional dissipation, they might, uh, you, you can think of the opposite part. But if I were to just consider this system of hard disks as a uh, uh, a simple dynamical system. I just track them and look at the Lyapunov to measure the Lyapunov exponents. Uh, it, it would still constitute a chaotic system, and uh, I would still expect to see a sum of Lyapunov, Lyapunov exponents that is not zero. So I'm a bit confused about the discussion you both just had in this. Well, so okay, so I don't okay. Uh, what so what you raise is very interesting. Um, I'm not actually very, that familiar. I kind of vaguely conscious of it, but about this result involving the Lapinov exponents. Um, what we have to be a bit cautious about here is that, and, and this is really where the distinction between the informatic and the full entropy production lies, is uh, what happens when you coarse grain. Uh, and what I'm not sure is if you coarse grain a system, whether, uh, you know, so presumably some of those Lapinov exponents become invisible, just as some of the entropy production becomes invisible like this chemical if i just you know i can in this last part i can just coarse grain the chemistry away and i know i just get the phi equation and so um what i'm not sure is whether there's a, a, any kind of um a way to associate the uh, different contributions to the end production at, via the laplanoff exponents to different scales of degrees of freedom in the system um and uh, i think Without that, it might become quite complicated because otherwise, the if you can't do that, then the the theorem will hold, but only if I treat everything. In other words, if in a, basically does coarse graining break that connection between Lapinov exponents and entropy production? Because here we know that um, if you define the entropy production via the forward and backward path probabilities. Uh, that at least gives me a way to define coarse uh, an entropy production in the coarse grain system. I just do the calculation with the coarse grain equations. I'm not quite sure how that would work with the Apanoff exponents. It'd be very interesting to find out. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, are there any other questions? I don't have a question, but I have a confusion. A confusion? No, no, I was just wondering, maybe I'm not uh, understanding fully in this bacterial ratchet example, which you showed in the beginning yes. of your talk. Uh, 
can one calculate the work done and the heat uh, from these kind of equations and get the uh, uh, um, correct expressions of the uh, efficiency and so on that was my right. Okay, so uh, I think, um, so yeah, I did slightly overstretch the analogy there. Um, what we don't have is a, a connection between these active models, active B and A, and that COG problem specifically. Okay, that was the confusion I had. No, 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 we don't. In other, in other words, you may need a better or different description of the bacterial motion than, than just this. Um, I, have no, I don't know how I would put a, rot you know, a, a rotating physical obstacle into such a theory, but we are working on that in a slightly more abstract way of, of, of uh, not necessarily an obstacle, but essentially a, um, a machine with the, the active model B, if you like, as its working substance. And um, the thing which is a bit complicated, I, I don't have mechanical forces in these models. I talked about pressure, but there, there isn't a link. I mean, I can't talk about moving walls and pistons and things as I can do. Uh, if I talk about um, the equations of motion for active Brownian particles, I can talk about pressure. I can talk about uh, making an engine uh, in the kind of classical way of compression and expansion. And we've, we've looked at that. For, active, uh, for just a, 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 um, a, a fluctuating density field, the engine yeah. has to be a kind of chemical engine. You have to, for instance, have a, uh, a step in an external field and use the activity to pump stuff up yeah. the step, which according okay. to what I was saying, you should be able to do. And then you should be able to see, uh, 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 create some kind of um, uh, set of conditions in which you can take work out. And then you can ask, how does that compare with the various entropy productions that I've uh, described? So that's definitely, on the agenda, but to connect it back to the particular case of the COG is uh, not something we can do. No, I think you have answered. Yeah, I got that. Got the idea. Thank you. Thanks. Um, are there any other questions? Uh, uh, I don't see any other questions in the chat box either. Um, if there are no more questions, I suppose we will wind up for the day. Professor Cates, thanks again very much for agreeing to speak at the, you know, for agreeing to give us the RRI colloquium. So thank you. Thank you very much thank indeed. You, it's been a pleasure. Thank you. And I hope to see many of you in real space before too long. It's thank getting you. a long time, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> okay. Bye for now. Everybody take care.